Hello, this is part two about my record shop venture in the 90s, what happened and everything. So I finished off saying that we'd kitted out the shop, we'd fitted it out. And the color scheme was a kind of greenish, uh, sort of teal green. Uh, we got the right carpet. We we put a table in, we put a round table with three chairs around it. And we even had the table and chairs painted to match the color scheme. That's how much detail we went into. We got a pine table and we paid, I don't know, at least two or 300 pounds to have it professionally painted. And all the joinery work and everything, everything was coordinated. It was done to such a high aesthetic standard, which is unusual for me because if anything, my computer shops, my secondhand computer shops looked a little bit tatty, if I'm being honest. Uh, I mean, they did very well because I was riding the wave of the, the boom in home computers, but I wanted to get this record shop absolutely right because classical music was my passion and I wanted to put, I wanted to do my passion full justice and that meant, that meant doing a full job on the uh, design and the color scheme of the shop and everything. So it was a shop that you went in, you went in through, obviously through the door. On the left was the shop counter. And within, if, within about five or six paces, you encountered a step, which then went up to one level. There was one, uh, yeah, just one step up. And then, so the second part of the shop was sort of raised up a level, only a little bit. And that's where the coffee table was. And there were units on each side for the CDs. Um, is that right? Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. So there were CD units on the right and left at the top. And then actually, if I'm honest, there were, there were also CD units um, at the bottom. I knew that CDs would be the big thing because we're talking about 1992. People had already moved on to CD and I knew that if I was going to run a successful record shop, CDs were going to bring in the bulk of the money. I just knew that. I mean, it was a no brainer. Any fool could see that. And that the records, which was my real interest, would be there, but they'd be a bit low key. So at the back of the shop, I then had a kind of, um, I don't know, how can I describe it? Like a kind of <laughs> trough on one level and then another level. And there was enough room there in total. I don't know, for about five or six hundred records. And then at the front of the uh, at the front of the shop, as you go in on the left, I had what I called a bargain bucket type thing where I put records, all those. I had a 50 pence section for people that came in and didn't really want to spend much money. So all the CFPs and all those budget records were put there. All right. And then I had the better stuff at the back of the shop. Now, I didn't really know too well the record market at that particular time in terms of collectibles. I was buying for the music. I had my favorite labels. I liked DG, I liked HMV, I liked Decca, but I had no appreciation of what SXLs were. Oddly enough, no, um, that's where I failed on my market research, definitely, but um, I had to learn in quite a hard way. So yeah, there was enough room in that shop for about um, a thousand CDs and about 600 records and then I had units for tapes at the back of the shop as well so there was enough room there for about two or three hundred tapes and then I had a shelf for videos and I had another shelf for musical books it was I'm telling you an absolutely fantastic shop it really was I mean it's my crowning glory of probably you know everything of all the different businesses I've had it's the one that I'm really sort of proud of so I advertised mainly in the local paper, Nottingham Evening Post, and um, I think I might have advertised in Gramophone Magazine and Classical CD. And of course, I had to I had to stock the shop. I already had. Okay, well, here's where I have to confess. I stocked the shop with my own CD collection. I hadn't actually sold it. I'd kept it. And I had about, I don't know, 300 CDs or something like that, opera sets, the whole lot. So I had that to get going, plus I advertised and I was actively, in the time I was thinking about the shop and designing it, I was also actively buying. I was buying in uh, CDs from wherever I, I could, advertising locally. And um, yeah, so I was building, I was building up stock records. 
I was selling a lot of records of my own that I wanted to get rid of, okay, to get the thing going. And I'd also been going to car boot sales and buying records basically from wherever I could. So I had a good stock when I opened up. I wasn't completely full, but I had quite an impressive stock when I opened. I didn't open, I didn't open at the weekend. I probably should have opened on a Saturday. I didn't, I can't remember why. I think I opened on a Thursday or something like that. And I was due to open at 10 o'clock in the morning. And um, I remember opening the door. And I remember there being three or four people waiting outside. I mean, look, it had to be a good sign. A lot of shops open and there's absolutely nobody. I know because I've opened shops and there's been absolutely nobody. But I mean, at first, but I knew when I saw several people waiting outside, they can't wait for the shop to open. I opened the door and straight away, this Chinese guy dashed in. He went straight to the back of the shop. Now, I'd bought in a small collection just um, uh, a few days previously. And one item was the Schulte Ring Cycle, not the original big box, but the reissue which came out in the 70s, the narrow band issue in the box. And this Chinese guy, I don't know if he'd looked through the window and seen it, but he shot straight through. I was selling it for £40 in those days, which... I don't know if you look it up now on eBay, what does it sell for? I'm not sure. I haven't checked. But I mean, I guess I'd probably sell, I would probably say that that sells for maybe £80 now. I don't know. Maybe it sells for some big price. Who knows? Yeah. So he went straight to that set. And it's strange, actually, because he didn't look at anything else. He came straight to the counter and put £40 down on the table. And that was my first sale. And he actually turned into a really good customer. He was a serious collector and he invited me to his house once because he was big time into violin music. He invited me to his house once, you know, months later. And he had a, I think he had a pink triangle turntable and uh, he had a couple of mono blocks. He lived in a tatty little terraced house. He was a student and his the room his 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 music room was a mess. There were clothes strewn everywhere and Chinese takeaway boxes. I mean everything. <laughs> and he said, "Sit down and listen to this." And he put on I think it was Campoli playing Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto on an Ace of Diamonds that he'd bought from me I think. And I sat down and it was fabulous. It sounded absolutely fabulous. Okay, Pink Triangle. They were really quality turntables. I don't know what the thought is on them now, but that was really... I noticed that the violin in particular uh, really sort of stood out. It was like the violinist was there and uh, the tone on the violin was absolutely superb. And yeah, I was blown away. That was a better better system than my system. And, you know, he smiled. I mean, he knew that um, he had something pretty good. So, yeah, so straight away on the first day, I had this... Chinese guy come in, other people came in. I was really busy on the first day. I don't know how much money I took. I think a few hundred pounds, which actually for a shop that you're paying 80 pounds a week rent on, and it's not even the busiest day, which is a Saturday, it's not a bad start. I knew then from the very first day, there's a demand, there's a demand for this and I'm going to do well. I just knew I was going to do well. And I went into manic buying mode. I thought I'm going to sell a lot and I've got to get a lot. I've got to really... Uh, start buying very actively, big time. So I advertised in the big um, music magazines, gramophone, classical CD, CD collections wanted, record collections wanted, etc. Plus, I had an A board outside of the shop, records wanted, CDs wanted, etc. People were bringing them in, and you know, I had no problems getting supplies in. I was paying, I don't know. Um, £2.50 for a full price CD. And I was selling them for about seven, eight pounds. So, you know, I had some margin there. Of course, you get stuck with a lot, but um, if you sell enough, you'll make money. Some will never sell. That's okay. Or you can sell them off cheaper, obviously cheap to get rid of them. So I knew that things were going to go well. And I was very, very busy. Saturdays were very busy. You know, I mean, from start to finish, 
uh, on a Saturday. In Saturdays in particular, in the first year, you know, I mean, there could easily be 15, 20 people in the shop, which for a little shop like mine was a lot. I mean, there wasn't really a lot of room. Now, I was doing fresh coffee free of charge, right? I wanted to create an environment where people feel comfortable and people feel welcome. They don't feel like they're being rushed. They don't feel like they're being uh, looked at. And they're also dealing with somebody who's knowledgeable and an enthusiast. And I had people that used to come in and they used to like to spend time talking to me. Um, I had a guy that used to come in and uh, his big thing was Mozart's Jupiter Symphony, um, Vorjak's New World. He had certain uh, important works which he liked to have. He was searching for like the best possible performance and he used to come to me with a pile of CDs and we would go through them listening to, you know, um, extracts. And he would say, oh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Bernstein's better on Mozart than Karajan. And yeah, I think I'll try this. And then he would bring it back and trade it in and said, oh, I didn't like the third movement. And <laughs> so I had all these different customers with their own quirks. Some of them, I had really big buyers. I mean, I had a doctor that used to come in and you know, every Saturday he would spend about a hundred quid or more. And then I had people who could, I mean, he would come in and he would only be there 20 minutes and he would spend a hundred pounds and he would go, I would give 10% discount on a good size purchase. And, um, and then I had people who would spend two hours in the shop and only buy one budget CD, but you know, that's all right. It doesn't matter because, um, I didn't want to put pressure on people to buy. I want to, even if they didn't buy anything, it didn't matter. I mean, look, it's nice to have people in a shop because it can attract others in. Have you ever walked past a shop and you've seen nobody in there and you've seen the uh, assistant or sales manager sort of, uh, you know, looking out, begging customers to come in? Doesn't really make you feel like going into the shop, does it? So I wanted to create a busy, a busy environment uh, to encourage people to come in. So yeah, uh, it worked out. It worked out really well. It was a very successful shop. And I started getting record dealers coming in. There were certain record dealers who were coming in and they were cleaning out all my collectibles for the low prices I was selling them at. And then I started discovering that there was big money in class in collectible classical records. I had, I had um, one guy come in. Uh, by the name of Gail Andrews. He was a big dealer in the in the 90s. I had a Kogan. I had the Tchaikovsky Kogan SAX, uh, which I was selling for about four pounds. <laughs> and he bought that off me for four quid. Yeah, what does that sell for now? About 3,000 pounds. But I didn't know. Information is everything. Knowledge is everything. And there was another dealer that came in by the name of Phil Reese. And he actually had a list of records he wanted together with prices he was prepared to pay. And for that Kogan, for example, he was prepared to pay 60 quid. And I said to him, oh, I had that last week, I sold it. He said, what? How much to sell it for? I said, four quid. He said, oh, look, take this, take this buying guide. And if you get anything like that again, that's what I'm prepared to pay. He said, oh, by the way, who bought it? I said, oh, I don't know, some guy called Gail Andrews. And he said, oh, Gail, he got here before me. Yeah, all the dealers knew each other. So, um, oddly enough, the next time I saw Gail, I said, hey, you bought that Kogan off me for four pounds, right? He said, oh, yeah, he sort of played a bit dumb about it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was my fault. It was, I lack the knowledge. So then I started looking out for valuable classical records and I'd had the shop for about two years. And um, to tell you the truth, it was actually, it's quite a tough job when you're there on your own, which I was running a shop six days a week. I felt like I was sort of created a bit of a prison for myself. I enjoyed it on the one hand, but I wasn't busy all the time. A lot of the time there were no customers and then there could suddenly be several and then a couple of hours, no customers. It was like that. And if you look at record shops today, it's the same. There's a record shop not too far from me. Whenever I walk past it, there's nobody in there. And it's the kind of business where somebody will just come in and spend a good amount of money and then go and I mean that's how it goes but generally Saturdays were busy all the way through when when I was doing it so I decided at some point I wanted to sell the shop 
and I wanted to focus on valuable classical records, the SXLs, the SAXs, because I could see there was good money to be made and I knew how to buy them. Uh, I had I had dealers that I was visiting who um, were not selling at the top price. And if I bought enough of them off them, they could, you know, they could sell me those records at a price where I could make good money if only I could sell them to the end user in Japan and South Korea. So I believed I could do that. So I sold my shop and I sold it to my father. My father knew about the shop. He had run it for me when I was abroad doing things and he liked it. And I told him I'm selling my shop. He gave me my price and he bought the shop off me in 1994, I think it was. So I only had it for two years. And then he had it for the next 12, year, um, 12 years, no, 10 years. He had it for 10 years. He did well out of it, and he finally closed in 2004, mainly because um, the second-hand CD market was kind of dying. Records were sort of okay. It was almost worth keeping it open just to buy in records, but he wasn't bringing in enough money really to, to justify being there. So in 2004, 12 years after opening, he closed finally, and the shop was bought by uh, somebody who was in the bespoke tailor business and obviously I mean it now looks nothing now like what it used to look so so that was it really so that was my so that was my record shop I haven't really gone I've, the, there's a lot more that I could have said but I don't want this video to go on forever about what it was like to run on a day-to-day -day basis I suppose I should say a bit more really because I suppose that the, the 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 customers really made the shop and there were so many interesting they weren't all interesting but there were a lot of interesting customers that used to come in and I mean there were some that weren't so pleasant as well for example there was a man who had some kind of um I don't know some kind of issues but he sort of dressed like a tramp he was in his 40s or 50s I'd heard that he'd been a maths teacher and he'd had some kind of nervous breakdown he'd walked out on his job and he started living like a bit of a hobo. He had a flat apparently and he liked classical music and uh, he would come in actually and he would he would smell very badly because he hadn't washed himself but I didn't have the heart to put him out or say anything. He would buy from that 50 pence section and the only time things did go wrong is when he came in and there was quite a sophisticated woman that came in and she was looking for some music and he started making obnoxious comments of a sexual nature and i think i had to ask him to leave because of that so yeah i was annoyed with him about that yeah so um i'm just saying that if talking about the day-to-day -day running of a shop any shop you're going to get situations like that that you've got to deal with but by and large people were really very nice i had i had a lot of people that i met there were a lot of disagreements with music a lot of disagreements about all sorts of things i had many many good-natured arguments with people about you know mozart for example who's my favorite composer and um i mean there was a guy that used to come in and say oh mozart's just chocolate box music and i mean we would have a we would have sort of good-natured arguments about that and uh yeah so it was very very interesting having all those different characters coming in and uh, running the shop in general. But yeah, I did feel that I had to move on because I was in my 30s at the time and I couldn't really spend the rest of my life sort of stuck in a shop. I like to sort of have a bit of freedom and move around and be able to do my own thing. So, but yeah, I did very well out of the shop financially and um, I take a lot of pride in what I achieved with it. I thought, think it was, I still think it's the best classical music record shop that the UK has ever had. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's my own, uh, that's my own opinion. I'll tell you who used to, who used to come in. Uh, there's a guy called Tom Fletcher who ran a business called Nottingham Analog. He made, made record players. He died, unfortunately, about 10 years ago, but he used to come in and he, he used to enjoy buying operetta. He would come in and he would usually spend 50 or 60 pounds every time. I went to his place once to listen to his amazing record players, but well, I never bought one, but uh, he was a really nice person. And 
He hated CDs. He absolutely loathed digital and he loathed, loathed CDs. He was an analog only purist. And I remember once that he knocked over one of my CDs. <laughs> he knocked a CD off a shelf onto the floor and he hates CDs so much he refused to touch it and pick it up, which I could forgive him for. But yeah, it was characters like that that would that would come in that would make it that would make it more interesting, definitely. Um, but he did comment later on when I spoke to him that after I sold it to my father, I bumped into him somewhere. I said, oh, do you still go into my shop? My father's running it now. He said, yeah, he went in once or twice, but it's not the same since you left. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, you know, your dad, bless him. He's a nice chap, but he hasn't got your knowledge about classical music and everything. He's not, I don't get the same feedback from him. And um, yeah, well, I mean, my dad doesn't really... Um, he doesn't really know a lot about classical music. Uh, I mean, he likes it, but yeah, he doesn't know much about classical music. He doesn't. You couldn't really hold a conversation with him about classical music. Maybe, maybe after a certain number of years, you could, because I've not really tested him. He's still alive. I must try and talk about classical music with him next time I see him, just to see how much he knows. Okay, well, I think this video has gone on long enough. So thank you for tuning in to part two. And... You know, if you've got any questions, put them in the comments. You know, I could talk about that record shop all day, but uh, I don't want to just ramble on about it. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.